Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. She's a postdoctoral fellow at Duke University, and her name is Zana. And she's going to speak to us on the Beginner's Guide to the Musical Scales of Cyber War. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jana. It is an honor to be here today to speak with you all about the law of war in cyberspace. And I'd also like to thank the Shmukon Group for this opportunity to share my research with you. So whether your background is in technology, policy, or academia, this is a beginner's guide to the musical scales of cyber warfare. Now, this presentation will juxtapose the law of war principles onto a piano keyboard to help visually explain how states evaluate the scale and effects of a cyber operation and determine a basis for employing force under international law. So using concepts of middle C and music intervals known as octaves, we'll explore together the range of state conduct during times of conflict. So at this point, you may be wondering to yourself, well, why on earth did she use a music analogy? Well, the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote that music is the universal language of mankind. So it was the intent in using a music analogy here to engage a greater cross-section of society in discussing these issues, to bring more cyber stakeholders to the table so that we can discuss how to mitigate conflict in this domain. Now, if you know how to play the piano, great. You'll be at a slight advantage, but if you don't, that's perfectly fine. Not only will you come away from today's presentation with a basic understanding of the law of war principles, but also a little bit on how to play the piano. So, and armed with that type of knowledge, you are well on your way to hosting a memorable dinner party. <laughs> Last but not least, my research today draws upon my work as the Ruben Everett Cyber Scholar at Duke Law School and my previous work as a postdoc fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center's Cybersecurity Project. With the preliminaries out of the way, let's dig in. And I move around quite a bit. If you can't hear me, just raise your hand. I'll come back to the podium. The main takeaway of this slide what is a cyber attack? I see a hand, so I'm coming back here. What is a cyber attack? Well, there is no standard international legal definition of what constitutes a cyber attack. And the closest that we've come to develop a conventional understanding of this was in 2013 with the development of a treatise called the Talon Manual. Now, this was developed by a group of governmental experts, and they defined a cyber attack as follows. It's a cyber operation whether offensive or defensive, that is reasonably expected to cause injury or death to persons or damage and destruction to objects. Let's think about that definition. What is it referencing? Well, here we have a loss of human life and harm in the sense of its kinetic physical effects. But what about data? After all, this is Shmukon. And this has been a common critique levied against this definition. What about harm to data? And other theorists have argued that there should be a broadening of the definition to include harm in the sense of uh, data systems, information systems, and networks being impacted by this. Specifically, Professor Matthew Waxman at Columbia Law University has advocated for the following definition. A cyber attack should include an effort to alter, disrupt, destroy computer systems, networks, information, or programs on them. But to present to you the other side of the debate, other theorists have stepped in and said, time out here. The problem isn't that we don't have some international legal definition of what a cyber attack is. The real issue is that we don't have a consensus on what misconduct in cyberspace really needs to be stopped. And I'd like to read to you some remarks by US Senator Mark Warner of Virginia which he offered at the National Security Agency's Law Day in June 2018, which are available on Lawfare's blog. Now, Senator M Warner bemoaned the lack of clarity on what cyber activities are tantamount to an attack. And he warned that, quote, failing to articulate a clear policy and to set expectations about when and where we will respond to cyber attacks is not just bad policy, it's downright dangerous. So I offer to you these competing perspectives on what a cyber attack is to underscore this point 
that the law and policy concerning this area are still very much under development. So I commend you for taking the time today, whether you're here in person or watching live stream, to learn the basics of this area of law. It'll be worth your time. Continuing with our music analogy, cyber operations are but one musical instrument in a grand symphony orchestra of power. The maestro, take your pick of a state actor or a non-state actor, cues the cyber section, sometimes in conjunction with other sections, to achieve the right concert pitch. By that, I mean a political objective, a military objective, or an economic objective. Now, a brief word on the political utility of cyber operations. If you're here today to talk about gray zone conflicts, we will get into that area later on in the presentation, so stay tuned. It's an exciting area, more to come on that. For now, however, I'm going to highlight that the US Department of Defense categorizes cyber operations into three areas. We have offensive cyber operations, and that's about projecting power to your adversary. Next, you have defensive cyber operations, and that's maintaining your operational capacity to maneuver in cyberspace, protecting your networks, data, and net-centric capabilities. Last but not least, we have the Department of Defense Information Network Operations, DODIN, and that's about protecting critical DOD communication systems, networks, and national infrastructure. So to frame our discussion today, I'd like to introduce to you a quote by the great U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who remarked that the right to swing my fist ends where the other man's nose begins. Now, apart from sounding like a code of conduct for an 18th century gentleman's fight club, I would offer to you that this is actually a very useful lens for looking at conflict in cyberspace. So when a state swings its fist in cyberspace and it collides with another state's nose, what does that look like? But more importantly, what legal rights are triggered as a result? And to answer that, we can turn to our first note on the keyboard, middle C. So just as when you're first learning how to play the piano, a beginner's starting position is placing their thumb on middle C, similarly here, when a state is conducting peacetime military operations or combatant operations, their middle C, their starting position, is the UN Charter and customary international law. So let's take this apart. Article 2, sub 4, places a prohibition on the use of force. However, there are two exceptions to this. The first one being recognizing the collective security power of the United Nations. Specifically, under Article 39 of the UN Charter, it recognizes the authority of the United Nations Security Council to determine if there's been a threat, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and offer up some modes of recourse for the aggrieved state. Second exception, Article 51 listed up here on the slide. Article 51 recognizes that all states are endowed with the inherent right of self-defense from an armed attack. I'm gonna go back to Article 2, Sub 4, which reads that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. So what is a use of force in cyberspace? Well, although there's no precise set of indicators for measuring this, in 2012, Harold Coe, a former legal advisor to the U.S. State Department, offered up some classic examples that have been commonly accepted. He argues that the following three examples constitute a use of force in cyberspace. One, operations that trigger a nuclear power plant meltdown. Two, operations that open a dam above a populated area. And three, operations that disable air traffic control, resulting in plane crashes. So what you'll notice about these examples, what do they share in common? Well, again, we have the threat of a loss of human life and harm in the sense that it's kinetic, physical harm. But I ask you, what about harm to data? How does that square into this current understanding? And it's an area that legal theorists and military scholars are struggling to answer. Next. Turning to Article 51, how is an armed attack defined? Well, to answer that, we can turn to our first case of the morning, 
decided by the International Court of Justice, a case called Nicaragua versus the United States. This was decided in 1986. Now the court ruled that if a member state exercises its inherent right to individual self-defense, the state must have been a victim of an armed attack. While the court did not define an armed attack, it did, however, describe the general nature as acts which can be treated as constituting armed attacks. Specifically, if such operations, because of its scale and effects, and those are, that's a key phrase that you'll hear me repeat throughout today's presentation, because of its scale and effects, would have been classified as an armed attack rather than as a mere frontier incident had it been carried out by regular armed forces. Thus, the scale and effects of an operation are the requisite inputs here for a state to determine if there has been an armed attack against it, and in turn provides it with that legal justification for invoking its right to self-defense under Article 51. That's the key takeaway here. So we've, we've discussed what is a use of force in cyberspace, what's an armed attack, what's the difference between the two? Good question. Now, Professor Michael Schmidt at the US Naval War College has offered up this general good rule of thumb. An all armed for, excuse me, all armed attacks are uses of force, but not all uses of force are armed attacks. Now this distinction is legally significant because if the cyber operation doesn't satisfy the de minimis damage threshold here, under Article 51 being an armed attack, well then the state has two modes of recourse. The first, appealing to the UN Security Council, under Article 39, the second, exploring other options such as diplomatic efforts, economic sanctions, and legal indictments. And we've seen the U.S. explore the option of economic sanctions in response to Chinese hackers engaging in state-sponsored economic espionage, and also against Iranian hackers for engaging in um, state-sponsored economic espionage. Now, although this represents the general consensus, the majority rule by the international community, the United States actually doesn't, dis doesn't ascribe to this view. Rather, from the US's standpoint, there's no legal difference between a use of force and an armed attack and a use ad bellum. Now, for those of you frightened by the Latin, we're going to take that very slowly, and I use a music analogy to help break that down. So just as you have a treble clef and a bass clef, music symbols to indicate the pitch of a written note, Similarly here, the body of the law of war, you have two separate legal regimes. You have the jus ad bellum, which is a set of laws that govern the right to war. And then you have the jus en bello, which is a set of laws governing the law in waging war. How I like to think about it, which might be helpful to you, just think of it as use one, then there's a triggering event, launching us into use two, where we're in a state of war, and the laws that follow that. With that framework, we can turn to our first octave set one, how states evaluate an armed response to a hostile cyber act under Article 51. Now the green range here, shaded on the keyboard, that represents the range of state conduct that is permissible. So the general international consensus is that the scope and effects of a cyber operation shape the victim state's characterization of it. So it's a two-step analysis for the victim state. One, what type of harm was produced? Have we met the de minimis damage injury threshold? And when you hear de minimis damage, I'd like for you to substitute it with death damage, high level destruction. That's an easier way just to cut to the core of what that's referring to. So if we have a hostile cyber act that produces that death damage, high level destruction, Second point of analysis, we need to ensure that any decision to employ force must be supported under a viable legal basis under international law. And if the United States is conducting this analysis, the third step is ensuring that any decision to employ force is also in accordance with relevant domestic laws, such as the US Constitution and the War Powers Resolution Act. But what happens if the act in question doesn't arise to that level of producing de minimis damage. What options does that leave the state? Well, again, the two general modes of recourse are appealing to the UN Security Council, and the second, exploring non-forcible countermeasures, such as economic sanctions, or exploring legal indictments and other diplomatic efforts. <laughs> 
octave set two. You'll notice a pattern now as we go out on the keyboard, uh, the different colors that will be represented. Now this range depicts state action that's likely permissible when evaluating a need for anticipatory self-defense. Now, the key difference between a permissible act of, of anticipatory self-defense and an impermissible act of preventative self-defense lies in the victim state's ability to demonstrate a decision by the aggressor state to attack it. So, for anticipatory self-defense to be lawful, there's a high standard of proof, and, and rightly so. The requirement here goes beyond merely proffering evidence of the state's hostile intent, but also evidence of some pending attack. So to that end, the complexities of pairing evidentiary standards here and attribution difficulties make it both politically and technologically complex for the state to confidently and publicly identify the aggressor state's intent to attack it and pending plans of attack. And to really do this subject justice, we need to pause for a moment to talk about attribution. Attribution being um, pairing a characteristic, a data, with an entity. Now, key point here, attribution is not a plain vanilla construct. In fact, I submit to you that it comes in a fun variety of flavors. Now, these flavors, these frameworks, if you will, were developed by computer scientist Professor Matthew Bishop, who is my research advisor at UC Davis, along with Kerry Gates and Jeffrey Hunker. And they develop these core frameworks to help explain the different types of attribution that exist. We'll briefly take these. The first, in a perfect attribution system, the so-called attribution problem doesn't exist. Here, attributes of both the sender and the recipient are known to both parties, always, in real time, and at little cost to the investigating party. And here, we can imagine who would benefit most from this type of a setup. Well, a surveillance state would prefer this type of model. And here, we can imagine that whistleblowers, journalists, oh, thank you. I've been released from the podium. Uh, whistleblowers, journalists, and activists would be at a disadvantage in this type of system. Now, the next one, perfect non-attribution, it's the complete opposite. So here, attribution would be impossible. We can imagine that whistleblowers, journalists, and activists would enjoy the anonymity, the protections that they'd have under this system, and the surveillance state or an authoritarian regime being unnerved by this type of a framework. Then we have perfect selective attribution. Well, here, the actor wants their attributes known to some entities that they trust, but not to others. So it's a system in which you can choose to whom your attributes are made known to and to what extent. So your name, your organization, your internet service provider, your IP address, etc. So this system is animated by a freedom of choice and also trust in the, the uh, entity in which you want to share your attributes with. Last but not least, we have false attribution. Now imagine, if you will, a world overpopulated with digital straw men. This would be the ideal petri dish for waging false flag operations, where actors can determine the attributes of another cyber actor and associated acts, but the data is wholly unreliable. Pivoting back to our keyboard, in theory, how would this operate? So imagine that innocuous state I's electrical grid was compromised by nefarious state N and also accurately attributed, publicly attributed, to state N. Now, in order for state I to be entitled to a use of force against state N, there's a three parts requirements test. First, the victim state's opponent must have decided to actually exploit those system vulnerabilities. Two, the strike is likely to generate consequences at the on-detect level. Again, think death, damage, high-level destruction. And three, the victim state must immediately act to defend itself. So there's a temporal requirement as well. In addition to that, there are also two principles that I'm going to explain to you that must be met whenever a state employs self-defense. The first being necessity and the second, proportionality. Now, what necessity refers to is taking actions that are necessary to achieve a legitimate military objective. So, essentially, the state's doing its due diligence to make sure that it's reasonably exhausted other peaceful means to resolve the conflict before employing force. And then you have proportionality, 
which is an attempt to use no greater force against your adversary than necessary to accomplish the mission. And it's also being mindful of the risk of collateral damage. Turning now to our third octave. Admittedly, this is the most complex octave to explain to an audience, but together, let's take this hill. So the third octave in orange here shows state action that may be somewhat permissible, and I'm exaggerating it that way for a reason, because the surrounding circumstances, uh, such as the scale and the effects of the cyber operation, and the legal status of the aggressor, ultimately shape how the victim state may respond here. So here, the range of qualifying hostile cyber activity can range from writing and executing malicious code, uh, distributed denial of serv service attack, providing malware or other cyber tools to a party to the conflict. And the state's analysis is even further complicated when you're dealing with proxy cyber actors, digital straw men, that may be clandestinely supplying financial support or other material support to the proxy actor. Now, in this area, we need to turn to another case law example and explore a doctrine called the Doctrine of State Responsibility. Now, the 2018 U.S. Department of Defense National Defense Strategy Summary makes clear that states are the principal actors on the global stage, but non-state actors also threaten the national security environment with increasingly sophisticated capabilities. And it lists terrorists, transnational criminal organizations, cyber hackers, and other malicious non-state actors as having transformed global affairs with increased capabilities of mass disruption. So ultimately, the analysis hinges on state responsibility. And the International Court of Justice's recommendation here has been to evaluate whether an armed attack waged by a non-state actor can be imputed back to the state. So, the key point being, if a state has effective control over the cyber operation waged by a non-state actor, responsibility could be imputed. With regard to how a state may respond to a cyber attack in this octave set, there's no requirement that the state respond in the exact same medium. And in fact, the United States reserved the flexibility of responding in a time, place, and manner of its choosing. In closing, how a victim state mounts a response in this octave set three varies based on its evaluation of the surrounding circumstances, its awareness of the informational environment, and overall mission readiness. Turning to our final octave, out of range. So these are notes on the keyboard that you cannot play and will not play. Preventative self-defense. So this is force that's employed to counter non-imminent threats under international law, which is illegal. And the second over here is using force in response to a cyber intrusion, a, a low-level attack. And this definition offered up here by Professor Gary Solis, who's an expert on the law of war at the Georgetown University Law Center, he defines it as a cyber operation, short of an armed attack, into another state's cyber systems, which would not constitute a use of force, not violating international law. And he offers up some examples of this of an intrusion, which could be routine intelligence gathering, it could be the disruption of non-essential cyber services, middling low-level attacks, like defacing a government website. Putting it all together now. So according to US Air Force Major General Charles Dunlap, who's a retired JAG, cyber attacks that have a violent effect are the legal equivalent of armed attacks what the military calls a use of force. And in military parlance, a use of force is regarded as an armed attack. So if a cyber operation constitutes an armed attack and it's credibly attributed to the state, or if it's a non-state actor, again, under the doctrine of state responsibility imputed back to the state, then the victim state's invocation of the individual right of self-defense under Article 51 is legally justifiable but it has to also be supported by the principles of necessity and proportionality. In sum, an a equation, if you will, which I developed for putting all of these doctrines together would be a cyber attack, I think a hostile cyber act, that produces violent effects, I think death, damage, high-level destruction, equals a use of force under Article 2.4. But 
what if a state's cyber punch doesn't amount to a use of force? Well, although I'm no Rod Serling, I would say, we've entered into a fifth dimension, an amorphous realm between peace and war. In short, next stop ahead is the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Again, I'm no Rod Serling, but uh, it's amazing what you pick up in law school. So, <laughs> I reference the uh, fantastic science fiction series, the, the Twilight Zone, as a teaching tool to explain the nuances of gray tactics in cyber operations. It's this amorphous realm between peace and war, and it fits so well as being the fifth dimension. That's what cyberspace is, is the fifth dimension of warfare. So here, we have an act in cyberspace. It's not a punch in the face. There's no physical kinetic effects, but it's more than being just a, a low-level intrusion. So it's this middle ground between the two that still packs a punch. And you may have heard the term gray zone tactics or gray zone space to describe this broad spectrum of activity. So a little bit on gray tactics and cyber operations. Now in 2015, then the US Army Special Operations Commander, Joseph Patel, testified before the House Armed Services Committee that actors leverage gray tactics as part of their strategy campaign and seek to secure their objectives while minimizing the scope and scale of actual fighting. So this is activity that's strategically calibrated to not rise to that level of a de minimis damage armed attack under Article 51, but it still deals a blow to your adversary. And some case examples of this, in 2014, North Korea's intrusion into the networks of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Now, in this example, the 2015 DOD Defense uh, Cyber Strategy Report references the Sony hack as an example of the political utility of cyber operations. And this case study demonstrates how these operations can present revisionist state actors with an attractive opportunity to undermine a state's values, in this case, free speech, and interests on a mass scale. So you're grabbing that international spotlight to highlight your cause with a relatively low, list, ro la, low risk of retribution. Another example, in 2016, would be Russia's involvement in leaking emails to the US Democratic National Committee and information operations targeting the integrity of the 2016 presidential election. But to build more granularity on this gray area, let's look at some common tactics. Types of nonviolent political cyber attacks. And these were developed by Professor Thomas Ridd at Johns Hopkins University. And there are three different types. You have sabotage operations. Now, these operations, they're highly targeted against your adversary's system and technology, where the machinery is the target here. There's no loss of human life, no physical harm to the human operator, but it can cause harm both financially and reputationally to the impacted entity. Quick example, in 2012, when Iran unleashed the Shamoon virus against Saudi Aramco, which is one of the world's leading suppliers of crude oil, in this attack, it wiped the hard disks of 30,000 computers, causing Saudi Aramco great financial harm. Contrast that now with subversion operations. Now, in this second example, the target isn't a machine. It's the human mind. And the goal of these operations is to undermine society's trust in institutions, eroding away social beliefs and values in a system to achieve your objective. Last but not least, we have espionage operations. These come in two different forms. You have traditional national security espionage, and then you have commercially motivated economic espionage. Now, what the latter is, is essentially stealing another state's other states' trade secrets, proprietary data, to then confer an economic advantage onto your home state. Now, the United States, as a matter of public policy, does not conduct commercially motivated economic espionage. However, other states, such as China and Russia, do engage in this type of espionage. So what's the future of Twilight Zone conflicts? Well, actors that employ gray tactics in the sphere need not technologically be successful in actually infiltrating the system. Rather, the sheer ramifications of the act in and of itself has the power to disturb a nation's psyche 
the sim symbology behind it is very powerful, grabbing the international spotlight to change the geopolitical status quo, garner attention for your revisionist ambitions is very powerful. And going forward, how the United States and other states develop countermeasures to address these types of tactics poses a, a new challenge. And that's not to say, however, that these are new to the pages of history, they're not. But the medium being used to amplify the effects is, in terms of how the US is exploring ways to respond, what have we seen? Well, we've seen the United States explore economic sanctions, legal indictments, with the Department of Justice's uh, recent release of indictments against several Russian operatives for engaging in information operations targeting the 2016 presidential election. And we've also seen in the fall the Trump administration signal a new approach to uh, the concept of defending forward in the cyber strategy report. And defending forward from the report, it's described as an effort to disrupt malicious cyber activity at its source. This slide shows a visual summarization of everything we've discussed today. And we've covered a tremendous amount of ground from what is the use of force in cyberspace, what is an armed attack, exploring the range of permissible state conduct in this sphere, as well as the impermissible, the doctrine of state responsibility, gray zone tactics, and attribution. Now, a more uplifting takeaway to give you from today's presentation, I'll end with this. Regardless of the medium in which conflict is waged, the Roman historian Livy's observation still holds true centuries later. Just as there are laws of war, there are laws of peace as well. So when a state swings its fist in cyberspace and it enters that arena of conflict, while it's acting at its own discretion and following these principles, it is still held accountable for its actions by the international community. So I thank you for your time and attention today. I have a handout, which is a visual summarization of the musical scales of cyber warfare I'll be distributing. But thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I'm not that tall. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, so first of all, I wanted to say really great job. I loved your analogy. Thank you. Um, I have to say, me personally, I was really surprised by the third octave, which states that a state can be held accountable for anything that a rogue operative does. Um, I was really surprised because, for example, the Geneva Convention for the Prisoner of War rules does not apply to for example, terrorists, which are people who aren't wearing uniforms, who aren't wearing badges that say what country they're from. And so essentially you would get the same thing in the third octave where you'd have a rogue actor who is not announcing like, I'm acting on behalf of this state when I'm attacking you and essentially is doing it on their own. However, it would seem that then if it was an attack on the United States, the United States could go after that home country. Um, has there been any discussion around that where normally that hasn't been the case previously? Thank you for your question. That's, yep. that's an excellent point that you've raised, that this area it is also very much still being developed, and it's an unsettled area. Uh, to your point, though, in terms of the, the legal considerations there, um, the protocol additional to the Geneva Conventions of 1949 the minority view by the international group of experts is that malicious non-state actors uh, that do not qualify as state-sponsored and armed opposition group are unprivileged belligerents in this area. So in other words, they're civilians taking part in hostilities directly. The majority view 
including the one that the United States uh, has adopted, however, does distinguish between civilians that engage in cyber operations during an armed conflict and unprivileged belligerents. And the Talon Manual, uh, there's a rule that's on point to this, Rule 29, which states that civilians are not prohibited from directly participating in cyber operations amounting to hostilities, but they do forfeit their protection from the attacks for such time so long as they're participating. Um, so at Rule 29, if that is an area that interests you, or if you're developing a paper on it, I highly encourage you to look at the 2013 Talon Manual's uh, analysis on that. It, they're still very much up for debate on can you impute the conduct back to the state under the doctrine of state responsibility? So, excellent. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was curious if the... Um, Russians had, uh, in late 2015 and 16, had attacked a U.S. power utility instead of the one in Kiev, or the ones in Kiev. What, what do you think are sort of re reasonable responses that the U.S. could have taken under these different frameworks? So if I understand your question correctly, uh, you were asking what the United States response could be to an attack on a, an ally, a third party, by the Russian government. Um, yeah, and in particular against a critical infrastructure, in this case, where they shut down the power. Okay. So in your uh, example, the, while the United States isn't the direct victim of it, the United States is a member of the UN Security Council, so if the aggrieved state here, um, Ukraine, in your, your example, comes to the United Nations Security Council, and Russia is also a, me a member, uh, and they were to bring that matter forward, the UN Security Council under Article 39 would determine has there been a threat, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and advise the aggrieved state. And then the state, Ukraine in this example, has the option of exploring legal indictments, economic sanctions, and other diplomatic efforts. That's been pretty much the, the parcel of responses that we've seen the United States adopt when it has been the victim of a hostile cyber act. So. That's the, the best answer that I can give you, those three. Uh, however, with the Trump administration's announcement of this new policy of defend forward and the uh, development of U.S. Cyber Command as its own unified combatant command, we'll have to look to the future to see how those changes will shape how gray zone tactics are evolving and how this type of activity uh, will take form. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to echo very interesting and entertaining um, presentation. One of the questions that I had was, it seems sort of like half to two-thirds of the legal citations you had were from U.S. law or legal or U.S. legal opinions. Has your research focus on how other countries, particularly U.S. adversaries, are applying these laws in their policies? Uh, thank you for your question. The focus of my research has primarily been on the, the West's view of these principles, but the Talon Manual, it's an international treatise. It was developed by a group of international government experts looking at these issues. Uh, in terms of Russia's specific approach to this, no, I haven't um, focused on a specific regional focus here. Uh, it's been the broader view of how the international community really the Talon Manual's articulation on how these concepts map out in cyberspace. But it would be an interesting area to dig into and in how states, let's say North Korea or Russia or China, their views on how the law of war applies or does not apply in cyberspace. So, thank you. Thank you again for linking international law and the cyber operations space. It's a very fascinating interplay there. Thank you. I feel as if a lot of the media focus and common discussion in information security space focuses on things that you have classified as out of range. Is that a factor of the novelty or esoteric nature of those attacks, or is that maybe a disproportionate representation of the actions that nation states are taking against one another? I would argue it's a, thank you for your question, I would argue it's a bit of both and also this paradigm of here the de minimis damage threshold where it's wedded to this idea of death, damage, high level destruction in the kinetic space and the question of what about harm to data, an attack on a state's economic system that while there aren't violent physical effects from that, 
it can still be just as debilitating as a traditional kinetic attack. So how the law is trying to catch up to that area and address it, um, I have yet to find a source that can satisfactorily answer that, but it, it's, you've, you've hit upon a huge divide in how in theory and in practice, how states respond to that type of an attack. Unfortunately, it's an open question. Thank you. So I, I love that question, uh, trying to get, what are, what's the precise, is there a formula? How do you calculate this? That, that's excellent. Um, no, unfortunately there's no precise set of indicators. Uh, the example that I cited earlier with Harold Coe, uh, the classic examples of a use of force here, you have a nuclear power plant explosion or air traffic control resulting in fatalities. There's no number wedded to that. Uh, that would also be a scary thought, I think, from a utilitarianism approach, if we had a threshold of the number of deaths, but we won't go down that path um, on this. Um, but no, there's no precise formula for mapping that. It's, it's kept fairly general of the de minimis damage threshold of death, damage, high-level destruction. So again, it seems to be that case studies that are um, being developed on this, will time will show what that standard is, but for now, it's strongly wedded to the traditional notion of a kinetic attack. So thank you for your question. Thank you.